The world today continues to be one great mission field, even in countries that have a long history of Christian traditions. The late Holy Father, Pope John Paul II, once said, it is not enough for us to discover Christ, we must also bring him to others. Hello, my name is Father Jude Eli. I'm a member of the Western Dominican Preaching Ministry. I'd like to welcome you to our presentation, The Church and Universal Salvation. I'm sure we've all come across people in our lives as we live out our own Christian Catholic faith, and they say, um, have you been saved? Have you been saved? And you say, what do you mean by being saved? Well, Jesus died for you, didn't he? Well, yes, he did. Well, then, are you saved or are you unsaved? Do you believe or do you not believe? And what does your church teach about salvation? We are a Bible church, they will say. When you read the Word of God, there's only one God, and He sent His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And when you believe in Him, the Father and I will come and will make our home in you. God abides in His people. God loves His people. And so I ask you, have you been saved? And as most Catholics say, well, I think I've been saved, whatever that means. Because you see, Catholics don't pose salvation using that question. It's how you pose the question. So this does get into the issue, what is the church's relationship between universal salvation? Is there a fall, is there a small number that's going to be saved? Is there a potentiality of universal salvation? Do we all go to heaven? Do we have options? Do we choose to where we go? How has God saved me? And what has he saved me from? People say, you know, I'm okay, you're okay. And so you ask the question, well, if I'm okay or you're okay, what is he doing up there? If we're all so okay. It raises the question. What is the church's relationship be to those who God has created? How does God save? Is it just simply say, once saved, always saved? Is it a matter of, if I simply believe for a second that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and God comes into my heart, is that enough to purchase everlasting life? Purchase meaning that I surrender myself to this God that paid the debt for sin by dying on the cross? That's how he purchases ever everlasting life. What is the church's relationship to that? Well, in the document by John Paul II, Dominus Jesus, that question is, in fact, articulated rather well. It says, furthermore, the salvific action of Jesus Christ with and through his Spirit, because we believe that all grace is mediated through the death and resurrection. That's how we're saved. All grace is mediated through Christ's death and resurrection. Why? Christ's death is, in fact, sacrificial. Christ's death, in fact, takes away sin. It takes away the obstacle of our relationship with our God and with each other. Sin alienates us from God. Sometimes we choose to be in that state of alienation. And, and of course, God will honor that. Why? Because we're made in his image and likeness. God is absolutely free. We have some relative freedom. So insofar as we come from God, we do have a certain... A, a certain amount and extent of human freedom. And we can exercise that freedom rightfully or wrongly. We can alienate or non-alienate. We can be one with each other and with our Lord, or we can say, no, thank you for the invite, I'm going elsewhere. So the question is, we as Roman Catholic Christians believe everyone receives sufficient grace for salvation. Everyone. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. He enters into the dynamic of being human. And he saves us from ourselves. He saves us from our unlovable selves. Those times in which we do love, well and good. Those times in which we do forgive those who wrong us, well and good. That's the grace of God. But the times in which we refuse to love, refuse to forgive, Refuse to be for the other while not compromising the self. For the times in which we refuse the other, the times in which that can be a cause of alienation, 
of the people that God has created in, in his image for our own lives. Sin alienates. Jesus redeems us from that alienation. And that is salvation. Salvation means to be in right relationship with God. There's a fundamental harmony that we have in God. Sin mars that relationship, hampers that relationship, puts obstacles, walls of hostility to that relationship. That's why, in a, in a profound sense, when Christ died on the cross out of love for us, he doesn't condemn the world, he loves the world. Why? The world came from him. The world came from God. And in John's Gospel, who creates the world? The Logos. Who's the Logos? The Word, the Wisdom, the Law that comes from God himself. The Law of God, the Wisdom of God, the Power of God, the Love of God, the Mercy of God took on flesh and died for us and says, My Father wants a relationship with you. You accept the invitation that salvation. And when you do, there's that oneness that we have with everyone and with everything that God has ever created. That's why Dominus Jesus, that document of John Paul II, makes it very clear. That salvific grace, that salvific act is in fact not just meant for Christians, it's meant for everyone. Why? Because Jesus Christ died for all. Not for the elect, not for the few, not for the some, not even for the many. He died for all. So is the activity of Jesus Christ somehow only contained within the church? It depends on how you understand the nature of the church. That's why the document will go on and say, furthermore, the salvific action of Jesus Christ with and through his spirit extends beyond the visible boundaries of the church to all humanity. Speaking of the Paschal Mystery, Paschal Mystery here means Christ's death and resurrection. Speaking of the Paschal Mystery in which Christ even now associates the believer to himself in a living manner in the spirit and gives him hope of resurrection, the Vatican Council said, makes it very clear, all this holds true not only for Christians, but for also for all men and women of goodwill in whose hearts grace is active. For since Christ died for all, and since all people are, are in fact called to the one and the same destiny, because we have the same destiny. Why? Because we have the same nature. There's that sense of unanimity, that oneness, since we have that same destiny, which is divine, we must hold that the Holy Spirit offers to all the possibility of being made partners in a way known to God and in the pastoral mystery. Translation, everyone has access to God by grace. Everyone has access to God through and by grace. And all grace of salvation is given through Christ. By whom? The Holy Spirit. That's, a, that's why we say even the non-believer can have an access to God's tender loving mercy, which is in fact redemptive by the Spirit. Why? The Father creates. How does the Father create? Through his Son, the Word. How does God redeem? Through the word of God proceeding from the mouth of God, taking on humanity, God redeems the world through his Son. The Son bestows the Spirit, and the Spirit is the avenue by which a grace is given to all. It would be unfair of God to create any individual without giving that individual the ability, the, God's tender loving mercy, that's what grace is, by the way, God's tender loving mercy poured out for them. We believe that grace is the individual's participation 
in the life of God. Did you get that? That grace is the participation of the individual in the life of God, which God bestows upon you. God freely gives to you. Grace is free. That's what makes grace grace. You don't have to work for it. It's gr it is graciously freely given. That's why you don't save yourself. God saves you. Yes, it is true that you do cooperate in the act of salvation by the election of your freedom to receive that grace. But grace is given, freely given to all. Now what they do with it is their business. But God in his predestinational will and knowledge at least potentially wills everyone to be saved. Whether or not you accept that God does not interfere with your freedom. That's how we're most like God. That's why in the Hebrew tradition, in Exodus chapter 3, when Moses asks God, what is your name? Before I go to Pharaoh, I need to know who sent me so that God might indeed be the goel, the vindicator, the deliverer of his people from bondage. God responds from the burning bush, hey, yay, Asher, hey, yay. From the burning bush, he says, I am who I am. I am what I am. And later, rabbinical transliterations of the divine name, I am who I am. I will be whatever I wish to be. Meaning God is absolute freedom. Since we're made in his image and likeness, we share in that freedom. It's a relative freedom. It is not an absolute freedom. It's a relative freedom. And insofar as we use it well, when we choose grace, we choose life. And not just life here and now, good as that might be, but life everlasting. And we as Roman Catholics hold that everyone has sufficient grace for salvation. Everyone. That's why the document will, in fact, continue and say, the church is the universal sacrament or sign of salvation. Since united always in a mysterious way to the Savior, Jesus Christ, her head, and subordinated to him, she has, in God's plan, a indispensable relationship with the salvation of every human being. For those who are not formally and visibly members of the church, salvation in Christ is acceptable and is accessible by virtue of a grace which, while having a mysterious relationship to the church, does not make them formally part of the church, but enlightens them in a way which is accommodated to their spiritual and material situation. This grace comes from Christ. It is the result of a sacrifice and is communicated by the Holy Spirit. It has a relationship with the church, which, according to the plan of the Father, has her origin in the mission of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The document will go on and say, with respect to the way in which the salvific grace of God, which is always given by means of Christ in the Spirit, and has a mysterious relationship with the church, comes to the individual who is non-Christian, the, the Second Vatican Council, limited itself to the statement that God bestows it in ways known to himself. And now it's the theologians are seeking to understand this question more fully. So in one way, there is that potentiality of universal salvation. Is it in the church or outside the church? We hold that those who have no knowledge of God or his gospel and are exercising their conscience in a way in which 
grace illumines the conscience. Again, grace illumines the conscience. There is a profound potentiality that if they accept that grace, even though they may not know the gospel, may not know even Christ himself, may not know what the church is, somehow because of of the origin of that grace, which is the Holy Spirit, given to us by Christ on the cross, who was sent from his heavenly Father, there is that potentiality that salvation is in fact theirs. Why not? Why not? It's it's God who died through his Son on the cross. God so loved the world that he empties himself and died for us. Yes. That's why St. Thomas Aquinas, when he, when he talks about who's in and who's outside the church, St. Thomas makes it very clear. The only person, technically speaking, that's outside the church are sinners. And, and of course you might ask, well, what does that mean? Well, there's formal presence within the church, baptism, And yet there's informal presence. How? By way of grace. Vatican Council makes that very clear. We are saved by grace. What is extraordinary for non-Christians, grace through sign, is ordinary for Christians. We are saved by the grace of Christ, mediated through his body, the church, and whether you are formally in the church or informally in the church by way of cooperation with that grace, can the saving power, can the, can the salvific activity of God still be released upon you? And the answer of the church says, absolutely. That's why theologians of every age are trying to figure out how does God work? when those who have not heard the gospel, those who have not been baptized, how does God still save them? And we hold that he does. That's why Thomas would say, the only ones that are only outside the church are are sinners. What does he mean by that? Profound sin alienates. And you choose to be alienated. And God will honor that. You're free, so is he. Conversely, if by good conscience, guided by grace through the power and gift of the Holy Spirit, bestowed on us by the, what the Council calls the Paschal Mystery, Christ's death and resurrection, you who have never heard of God, but seek that, that unitive relationship that all religious traditions seek in their own way, to the, uh, to the capability and to the ability that they can, God will honor that. This is not to say, by the way, that other religious expressions or other religious traditions, good as they are, are equal to the salvific activity of Jesus Christ. Nothing is equal to that activity. Nothing. And yet God will use the imperfect and elevate it and still see it as a means by which men and women of every age, of every time, and of every condition, if they cooperate with the grace of God, they can be saved. So it's not a matter of saying, have you been saved or unsaved? Other Christian churches, other Christian denominations might hold a different view they would hold to an exclusive view. Unless you exclusively profess publicly that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, you will not be saved. That is the exclusive view. You must profess this in order for the grace of God to enter into your life. We do not hold that. We respect the difference, however, We do not hold to that belief. We hold to the inclusive view that God wishes to include 
rather than exclude his love for the people that a son died for. So it's by grace that you are saved. Not by relative religious traditions coming from different founders, coming from different times within human history, and coming from different cultures. No, they do not save. They do not have the capability of saving. And yet can God in time raise up that which is less than and see it as a means by which, though limited, his grace can still permeate the lives of individuals, the sanctuary of the conscience of the individual, and we say yes. That's why we do not take the exclusive view. We say God is greater than our ignorance. God is greater than our inability to understand. God is greater than our inability to alienate ourselves from him. We hold that grace is in fact possible. Why would God create any individual and not give that individual the ability to know him in some way? And if we say there is a commonality of all human beings, the anthropologists would hold that, even though there's relativistic cultures and all that, different times, different places. <clears throat> when you look at the human condition, there's a commonality. Yes, there are differences, absolutely, and we cannot minimize that. But yes, there is a commonality. And we hold that is the commonality in which the grace of God works. So, is there a sense of universal salvation? Yes. Does it come through, does it come through and by many religious traditions? No. It comes by the grace of God that's present in those religions, those religious traditions in some mysterious way. But there's only one Savior. That's why as Roman Catholics, we, we must never forget the principle that what God creates, God expects to have respected. What God creates, we respect. That's why the Vatican Council's declaration on non-Christian religions, it makes it very clear with those who, are, who differ from us. We cannot truly pray to God the Father of all if, if we treat any people in other than profound brotherly fashion. For all men are created in God's image. Man's relation to God the Father and man's relation to his fellow men are so dependent on each other that the scripture says, he who does not love does not know God. There is no basis, therefore, either in theory or in practice, for any discrimination between individual and individual, or between people and people, arising either from human dignity or from the rights which, they, which flow from it. We believe we are all children of God, and grace is, in fact, wonderfully available to all. May we respect the grace, the spirit, and the activity of God in the other, even though the other might differ from us. We are still sons and daughters from the same God that sent his only begotten son not to die for a few, not to die for the many, but for all. You can share that grace with your freedom, with your conscience, respond to that free gesture, that free 
invitation to know the God that brought you into existence. And so may the word of God, rich as it is, dwell within our hearts this day. Do you know the greatest gift that you can give Jesus? The gift that no one else can give but you. Yourself. Have you ever given yourself to Jesus? Have you ever said, Lord, I present myself to you, I give myself to you, and I ask you to come and dwell in my heart? Have you ever done that in your life? Never? Ever? And it's about time you did. And it's real simple. The Lord loves you so much, he would never impose his will on you or force himself into your heart without you opening the door. So you have the key. And the key is saying yes to Jesus and inviting him to come into your heart and into your life. Would you like to do that? Then pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I open up my heart and I invite you, Lord, to come in and dwell there. Come into my heart and into my life. Fill me with your grace, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. Cleanse me of every sin, of every wrongdoing, every offense I've committed against you. Fill me with your grace, Lord. Mold me and fashion me, Lord, into the person that you have destined me to be. Help me, Lord, to follow you with a servant's heart. I acknowledge you as my Lord and my Savior. And I thank you, Lord, for coming into my heart and into my life. Amen. Now, that wasn't hard, was it? But the Lord has been waiting all your life for you to do that because no one else could have done it but you. So thank you for praying that prayer. If you prayed that prayer, thank you. And the Lord thanks you.